This event wouldn't happen, uh, I'm talking about the book festival now, without the staff. It's a tremendous effort. Um, this is our third year for the book festival and it has grown so much this year and it's a real testament to the hard work of the staff and their dedication to get authors here and make it an event that people want to be a part of. So, um, The Board of Library Trustees has awarded this honor of the Rose Dorothea for the past four years to a writer who has made a lasting contribution to the lit literary world while living on the Outer Cape. Tonight I am very pleased to introduce Marge Piercy, who is this year's award recipient. Marge Piercy, writer, poet, activist, gardener, and teacher, has been a resident of Wellfleet since 1971. Um, if I'm a little nervous, it's because um, this is a really big deal for me. She's Marge Pierce, she's one of my favorite writers, so the fact that this is happening is a little bit out of body. Marge Piercy was born in Detroit and educated at the University of Michigan in Northwestern. She's lived in France, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, and New York before settling in Wellfleet. We left out a couple places. Okay. <laughs> Cambridge. That's okay. Okay. Marge Piercy is the author of 20 books, including 17 novels, three of which were national bestsellers, Gone to Soldiers, Braided Lives, and Women on the Edge of Time a short story collection, essay collections, and a memoir. She's also written 20 books of poetry and has co-authored a play and novel with her husband, Ira Wood. Most recently, she published a poetry book titled Made in Detroit, an essay collection called My Life, My Body. As if her contribution as a writer isn't enough, Ms. Piercy is also a beloved and sought after writing teacher. For over five years, she has held a week-long poetry intensive <laughs> Eight years, thank you. All those, that Wikipedia. Yeah. Okay. Um, at the Wellfleet Library called Piercy Intensive Poetry Workshop. It is open to only 12 poets who apply for admittance by submitting their poems. Participants have traveled to Wellfleet from all over the world to study with Marge Piercy. One participant said, I just wanted you to know that the workshop was truly one of the best I've ever attended. The topics you discussed seem to be tailor-made to fit our needs. I feel ready to take on poetry again with a new dedication, devotion, and insight. I am able to write with more abandon now. Your workshop has given me the determination to act. It was a life-altering experience. Ms. Piercy is also an active feminist was an active feminist voice in the Students for a Democratic Society in the 1960s and became an associate of Women's Institute for Freedom of the Press in 1977. When I read bios and interviews of Marge Piercy, I am moved by her perseverance. Her perseverance in the face of health issues, in the face of social and political injustice, I appreciate her acknowledgement of the importance of her team, her joy in growing her own food and flowers. Most importantly, how she has made life choices, many difficult and unpopular, to ensure that her life would be one of a writer. It is an inspiration and a model for others who know that in their hearts that they must make their art or craft or writing the very center of their lives. So tonight we are very delighted that Marge Piercy will be um, reading some of her poetry for us and then um, after that we'll be giving her the award and after that we'll enjoy some refreshments in the Bowsprit room and um, we'll have books for sale and do a signing. So please help me welcome Marge Piercy. Yes, that was a lovely introduction. I don't think this is working. Yeah, it is. What? Yeah, it is. Okay, great. That's a much nicer introduction than I had once at Lake Forest when the president of the English department said, 
The poet's name is Marge Piercing. I never heard of her, but the younger faculty made me invite her. I'm going to move that back a little so I can actually see. In storms, I can hear the surf a mile away. You may love the ocean. Never boring, always in motion, sliding up the shingle, then suck back down. Waves with manes of white lions lashing at the shore. Waves standing like a bear tearing at the dunes. You may love the ocean, but it does not love you back. It, it would as soon eat you as keep you afloat. Perhaps it loves the great whales. Perhaps it likes walruses, but it's always hungry. You may love the ocean like my friend who at 80 will go far out twice a day if he can get a tourist to pay his gas. He likes to be out of sight of land. The sea lurks under his boat waiting. The ocean is always beautiful here in all weathers it churns up. It does not approve of land and wants to take it back. Someday it will. Even the hill I live on, sandy bottom, tides will stir the ashes of my mother and the tiny bones of my cats. My grave will be home to crabs. Who is to say? It is not just that the ocean take into itself what long ago it gave us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you still want to do it at the end, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise it's like a popularity contest. The suicide of dolphins. No one. Not even the scientists who study you know why you beat yourselves, whole family groups, communities on our base sand to gasp and die. Unless the volunteers call phone to phone quickly and a spider web of summoning can keep you wet and push you out into deep water again, like shoving a huge wet sofa. <laughs> Some think it's disease or following your leader into danger or chasing fish into water too shallow so you run aground. An old fisherman said to me, they remember how they used to live on the land. They remember. We know nothing, but still we grieve. Is your act any more opaque than a friend who drank himself into a fiery crash? Another who burns his brain to a crisp on crack. The woman who could not walk on and her husband, even after the fifth trip to the emergency ward, leaving only feet first when he shot her. Or my friend's daughter who hung herself at 15 because of names she was called, because of words on a computer, because of a boy. We cannot stop each other but still we grieve. The poor are no longer with us, say politicians. They mourn the middle class which is shrinking as we watch in the mirror. The poor have been discarded already into the oblivion pale of not to be spoken words. They are as leopards were treated once to be shipped off to fortified islands of the mind to rock quietly. If poverty is a disease, quarantine its victims. If it's a social problem, imprison them behind high walls. Maybe it's genetic. How often they die of easily preventable diseases. Feed them fast garbage and they'll die before their care can cost you of heart attack, stroke. Provide cheap guns and they'll kill each other out of your sight. Ghettos are such dangerous places. Give them schools that teach them how stupid they are. But always pretend they don't exist because they don't buy enough, spend enough, give you bribes or contributions. No ads target their feeble credit. 
They are not real people like corporations. <laughs> One of the expendables. Is this working? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Cape Cod is wed to the mainland by two bridges on mild weekends and all summer, fed by miles of backed up cars. Right across the Massachusetts Bay, one of the worst nuclear power plants, clone of Fu Fukushima, leaks into the bay. On its roof, over 3,000 spent rods, vulnerable to hurricanes, flooding attack from the air or land, its squats menacing us. We who live here all year are the hundreds of thousands of summer visitors we have been deemed expendable, since we cannot by any means be evacuated. Shelter in place means breathe in, absorb through your skin, drink, swallow, eat radiation. Your home will be uninhabitable should you happen to survive, at least before cancer dissolves your organs. The land, the pure water we cherish, will be tainted for generations. Fish, birds, your dogs and cats, raccoons, squirrels, coibles, expendable too. We count for nothing compared to the profits for a utility housed in New Orleans, where you'd imagine they know floods. We're the throwaway people, not important like corporations. Chop off the crooked arm of Cape Cod and let us bleed. Let's meet in a restaurant. Is food the enemy? Having a dinner party has become an ordeal. I lie awake at night before figuring how to produce a feast that is vegan, gluten-free, macrobiotic, <laughs> acidic food, and tomatoes, wine, all nuts, low carb, and still edible. <laughs> Are beetles okay for vegans? <laughs> Probably not. Forget chocolate ants or fried grasshoppers. Now my brains are cooked. Finally, seven o'clock arrives and I produce the perfect meal. At each plate for supper, a bowl of clearly washed pebbles. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> our never-ending entanglement. How long do we mourn our mothers? Unfinished business, unspoken sentences that burn on the night, tangled thickets of stymied love, steps worn smooth with scrubbing, never to be climbed again. We mourn our mothers till we ourselves are out of breath. That umbilical cord between us never really cut, no matter how hard we tried in adolescence to sever it. Once there was warm milk in a sweet stream. Once there was a brush stroking through my long hair. Once there was a lap. Once there was a slap. Shards of glass. Will anyone ever come as close or push as hard? As we age, we see your face mirrored. Your diseases weaken us. Your si silences haunt us. Your stories echo. We feared becoming our mothers, yet when we were not you, we felt guilty. You made us even when you hated the results, for you opened your hands, and out we flew. Illegal with only hope. The mother imagines a few more steps, another push across the minefield, just one more night hiding in rank bushes. She can carry her child across the border to some kind of safety, anything better than what she flees, hauling her child through the fields of hell. She has a wound on her leg, untended, unbandaged, bleeding now and then when weeds, branches brush it. She has a deep wound inside, 
The wan face of her older child is a life drained from it with blood from a blast that tore his flesh apart. The dusty body of her husband fallen into a ditch. The dish where she shuttled, holding tight, the still living child who is all she can imagine of any future. <coughs> so she slugs forward toward that invisible border where mothers can keep their children safe, perhaps, in a world on fire. One summer day in paradise. This I actually had some. At Nookum Hollow Beach, waves all the way from Gibraltar roll in with manes of white foam. Seals are hauled out on the sand that in places shines with tiny grains of garnet. Whole families lie together, a town of seals occasionally barking one to the other. Above them hang the steep dunes, tur turns plunge sending up spray. A young woman walks the beach, phone in hand, her eyes fixed to her phone. Is this how the biosphere ends? Everybody in media bubbles, or the world burns to ash. They inhabit me. There was water, I know. Here we go. I'll never forget, I was giving a reading at a library in New York City, and I opened the water and spilled it into the microphone. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh sure. <laughs> <laughs> I am pregnant with certain deaths of women who choked before they could speak their names, could know their names before they had names to know. I am owl, the spirit said. I swim through the darkness on wide wings. I see what is behind me as well as what is before. In the morning, a fast flash of blood on the snow marks where I found what I needed. In the mild light of day, the crows mob me, cursing. Are you the daughter of my amber clock tower eyes? I am pregnant with certain deaths of women whose hands are replaced by paper flowers, which must be kept clean, which could tear on a glance, which could not hold even water. I am cat. I rub your prejudices against the comfortable way they grow. I am fastidious, not as a careful housewife, but as a careful lover, keeping genitals as clean as face. <laughs> I turn up my belly of warm sensuality to your fingers purring my pleasure and letting my claws just tip out. Are you the daughter of the fierce Ari of my passion scrawled on the night? I am pregnant with certain deaths of women who dream that the lover would strike like lightning and throw them over the saddle and carry them off. It was the ambulance that came. I am wolf. I call across the miles my messages of yearning and hunger, and the snow speaks to me constantly of food and wanted friend and foe. The air there is heavy with ice, tweaking my nose, and the sound of the wind is sharp and wetted, constantly chatting, calling. We run together through the net of sense, querying, are you my daughter? I am pregnant with deaths of certain women who curl wound in the skeins of dream, who secreted silk from spittle and bound themselves in swaddling clothes of shrouds. I am raccoon, I thrive in woods, I thrive in the alleys of your cities. With my little hands I open whatever you shut away from me. On your garbage I grow glossy. Among packs of stray dogs I bear my teeth and the warring rats part. I flourish like the Elianthus tree in your trash heaps. I dig underground castles. Are you my daughter? 
I am pregnant with certain deaths of women who wander, slamming doors and sighing as if to be overheard, talking to themselves like water left running, tears dried to, st to table salt. They hide in my hair like crabs. I'm talking about the crabs you get in here. <laughs> They are banging on the nodes of my spine as on the door of a tardy elevator. They want to ride up to the observation platform and peer out through my eyes for the view. Oh, this wanting creates a black hole where ghosts and totems whirl and join, passing through into antimatter of art, the alternate universe in which such certain deaths as theirs and mine throb with light. Have you ever wondered who first ate an oyster? <laughs> Is, am I still open? Can you still hear me? Yes, I just like to check, because it's ridiculous to give a reading. Nobody can hear. How gray, how wet, how cold. They are bits of fog caught in armor. The outside pretends to the solid solidity of stone and requires force and skill, beating in to cut the muscle, shatter the illusion. If you stare at them, your stomach curls. <laughs> the gray eyes of Athena pry it out of the texture of heavy phlegm, chill clots of mortali mortality and cum. They lie on the tongue distillations of the sea, fresh as the morning wind that tatters the mist, sweet as cream but with that bottom of granite, the taste of deep well, water drawn up on the hottest day, the vein of slate in true Chablis, the kiss of acid sharpening the tongue. They slip down quick as minnows, darting the cover in the mouth remembers sex, both provide a meeting of the primitive and worldly, in that we do little more for oysters than the gull smashing the shells on the rocks, or the crab wrestling them open. Yet in subtle flavor and the choice to taste them raw comes the delicacy not of the brain, but of the senses, and the wit to leave perfection there. Oh, I should do this one next, it's sort of late. The first time I tasted you. The first time I tasted you, I thought strange, metallic, musty, with salt and cinnamon, the sea in the kitchen, safety and danger. The second time I tasted you, I thought known, already known. Perhaps in an oasis of dream, in the desert of a hard night, the dry wind parching me, I tasted the fruit of a tree that promised not life but love, the knowledge of being known at last down to the gnarly pit. What we know and don't of each other goes on, a voyage not infinite but long enough, notching years on our bones, from your body I eat and drink all I will ever know of passionate love. From now till death drains the chalice. After the corn moon, swallows thrown from a giant can turn moats around each other, hurtling over the marsh and back. The young grown, the flock assembles on the wire, neat, formal, they turn sleek heads south. Every rambling poison ivy vine burns in a few scarlet leaves, grass tawny as lions, a salt meadow now has fur rippling over the bunched, the bunched muscles and the wind. Leaner and raspier than last week, hungrier for something to rub, something to strip. The robins are drunk on rum cherries. The garlic falls over, the rose hips redden. 
Every day we peer at the grapes, watching them color, puckering sour. The houses are all rented and the roads jammed with people driving their tempers flat out or boiling their brains dry in traffic like percolators, searing good coffee to battery acid. Soon they will go home and the ponds will clean themselves of so suds and the piss of psychiatrist children. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I don't have any ponds in August. And the, fried, <laughs> and the fried clam shacks will put up their shutters and the air will smell of salt and pine again. This land is a room where a party has gone on for too long. Nothing is left whole to break at the blousy embrace of heat slackens. I long for the feisty bite of cold mornings, the bracing smack of the sea wind after that first storm, walking the great beach alone. The bed of summer needs changing to roughened sheets that smell of the lime. Fall seeps in like energy quickening till it bursts out, burning crimson from creeper and tree. Even in this heat, I walk farther and faster, having the sea, hearing the seas rising mutter. The birds seem all in a hurry. The season of death and fruition comes near, of ripeness and rot. Sometimes a knife of frost is a blessing. Swear it. My mother swore ripely, inventively, a flashing storm of American and Yiddish thundering on my head and shoulders. My father swore briefly like an axe descending on the nape of a sinner. But all the relatives on my father's side, gosh, they said, God damn it. What happened to those purveyors of soft, putty cussing? Go to heck, they would mutter, you son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> they had limbs instead of legs. Privates encompassed everything from bow to stern. <laughs> they num did number one and number two, and eventually, perhaps, it. <laughs> it has always amazed me there are words too potent to say to those whose ears are tender as baby lettuce. Often those who label us into narrow jars with salt and vinegar say people like them, meaning me and mine. Never say the K word or the N word. Just quietly shut and bolt the door. Just politely insert your foot in the other's face. <laughs> Well, these are the days of awe between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And uh, what Jews do at this time of year is Tashlik, which is going, you go to water flowing out to the sea and you cast your sins away and you repent. Well, away with all that. Where the Herring River meets Wallfleet Bay, the tide carries brackish water out to sea. I arrive with my pants pockets stuffed with stale bread. As I tear off each piece, I name what I'm praying will depart. Envy and prejudice sink under their own weight like hunks of granite. Impatience starts out into the bay waters, vanishing as a fish rises to gulp it. Procrastination, sloth, any back and forth at wave's edge. Conceit prances out on wave tops. Anger and malice bounce off each other and sink down into the sand. Intention never carried out simply comes apart. It is all me. It is all I wish were not me. Wishing won't do it any more than old bread can rid me of what I must pry out of myself every day. Intention that wears through like an old runner on stairs I must climb to the top. If only I could discard my rotten parts as simply as I toss these bits of bread too hard to eat into waves that push, push, push 
my main sins to the bay, to bigger bay, and out into the world ocean. All that remains. A pillar of salt would slowly dissolve in the season of rains, as women have so often melted from history, so many nameless wife of, daughter of, the maidservant of. Their faces peer out between the black logs and squiggles of Hebrew letters as through bars. We were here too, they whisper like pages turning, pages on which their fates are sometimes written, always by others. The strongest ones, Miriam, Deborah, hold their names gripped in their teeth. Diving through the letters into the white light between, I seek them out, wife of, daughter of, maidservant of. Their silence deafens me. This is called the Tao of Touch. What magic does touch create that we crave it so? That babies are not thrive without it? The nurse who cuts tough nails and sands calluses on the elderly tells me that sometimes men weep as she wrote solution on their toes. Yet the touch of a stranger, the bumping of or predatory thrust in the subway is like a slap. We long for the familiar, the open palm of love, the tender fingers. It is our hands that tamed cats and the pets, not our food. The widow looks in the mirror thinking, no one will ever touch me again, never. Not hold me, not caress the softness of my breasts, my inner thighs, the swell of my belly. Do I still live if no one knows my body? We touch each other in so many ways, in curiosity, in anger, to command attention, to soothe, to quiet, to rouse, to cure. Touch is our first language and often our last as the breath ebbs and a hand closes our eyes. And the last poem I'll read is Joy to the World. Now I must learn to understand, to accept deaths of those that have loved, the pain of weak joints, new memory full of holes that days' faces slip through. There is no other life but this with all the grime and guts. Breathing becomes an art. Every morning is still new when the sun rises whether we see it or not. Every flower is a gift I've lived to smell. Love glows more intensely in the twilight. I polish old memories, amber taking on heat and power till they shine. There is no boredom now, for each moment is precious as a kitten and requires much care. What can I take for granted now? My own hand is strange to me. I dream less and sleep more deeply. I let ambition rise, drift off like a helium-filled balloon until it's just a speck, free of its prods and jerks. I sit in every hour seeking to enjoy it. Everything slow ebbs and glides away, away. My body has its own agenda, carrying me along. Praise my aching body that still gives me pleasure in the arms of my long love. Praise the land that feeds me and many wild creatures that still gives me joy in each, se in each season with its colors and otherness. Praise friends who help and companion me. Praise the cats with their loyalty. So much of my life was struggle to survive, to learn, to write what I had to, to find love. I let go of all but love now till the end. Thank you.